Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian Bay. I am the faculty advisor for the Georgetown University War Game Society. I am joined by Lexi Brill, uh, our current program director and future president. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, quick introductions of who we are. Uh, my, uh, like I said, I am the faculty advisor uh, where I teach a war game design course called the basics of war gaming within georgetown center for security studies i'm also the co-chair of the moore's war gaming cop and a group Krulak fellow at the marine corps university i also teach similar courses at the u.s naval academy and command staff at marine corps university um lexi i hand it over to you hi yeah so as sebastian said um current programming director for the georgetown university war gaming society otherwise known uh, as goose uh, participating in some gaming design competitions. So if you're familiar with Zenobia, you'll see um, mine and my partner's name on there. Uh, I work full time as a war gaming analyst. So I'm just kind of that general MA candidate right now at Georgetown um, in the uh, SSP program. Um, so just that usual disclaimer, uh, these are our opinions and views alone. You should see a banner you know, across the bottom pretty shortly about um, these are not representative views of our employers. Etc. So with that, so I will pre uh, briefly go over the the structure of our presentation. This will be largely based on what Goose is and my course at Georgetown, and we'll talk about a little bit of what we are currently doing and what we will plan to be doing in the future. Uh, Lexi will be talking about the first bit of what is war gaming for those who are new to connections and new to our field, uh, and then I will talk about my basics of war gaming course at Georgetown, uh, and then we'll pivot to all the cool and fun stuff that uh, Georgetown University War Games Society affectionately called Goose is currently doing some of our lessons learned from the COVID era uh, and what is on their horizon. Um, so I hand it over to Lexi and I will jump off with you. Yeah, so real briefly, this is kind of the what is a war game definition. Um, we're going to be going off of for the duration of this talk. This is the standard Peter Perla from um, the Art of War Gaming. Um, just emphasizing that there's some sort of dynamism, um, there's a synthetic environment, and then we want players to really emphasize their decisions and the consequences of those decisions. And this is gonna be really important um, as Goose as an organization focuses on, on student interactions. Um, so we have a couple games over there that we've kind of played and, and floated over at Goose. Um, just wanna capitalize, and this is a big thing for me in, in my professional life too, war games, can be intellectually messy, right? Um, and we don't wanna confuse war games with military drills or exercises. Um, what I've noticed just in talking with peers and whatnot, there's this kind of conflation between um, what is a drill, a military exercise where you're moving iron around versus what a war game is and where you're working through some of those uh, simulated decisions. So by nature, um, war games explore human decision-making. So you have to put some sort of a decision, whether it has a consequence or you're thinking through um, a critical piece of your, your force structure, et cetera, um, and look at the factors that might influence some of those decisions. Um, so important caveat here at the bottom, um, and Sebastian can speak more to this a little bit later, but wargaming can be applied to create um, other games, i.e. like crisis response games. Um, you know, a lot of simulations are used in teaching, et cetera. So really important to capitalize that wargaming is, is kind of all encompassing of this and can be quite uh, subjective. So moving along, um, this is one of Sebastian's actually uh, design games here, uh, Assassin's Mace, which Georgetown you know, uh, frequently runs and will be running, uh, I think later on this month. We like to use games um, in the traditional adversarial role, sometimes for the red versus blue, um, working through kind of, I know a couple of, oh yeah, sorry, Sebastian runs Assassin Mace. I should specify, uh, not a designer, he runs it for us. Um, and we should probably emphasize that we use serious gaming for some of the most serious topics like pandemics, humanitarian response, um, but also there can be very simple, you know, policy challenges are changing. Um, so for me, from my uh, student perspective, when I go into a class and we like to work through different policy changes or you know um, how a national security council works, stuff like that, 
a lot of times uh, games are a really good opportunity to work through some of the consequences of those decisions, as well as the process. Um, so, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis games were a, a really good opportunity last semester. And a lot of times these games are, you know, uh, give and take action sequences can be played virtually. So moving along, brief history. Um, I'm sure there are many people on the call who are uh, more familiar with uh, games dating back to, you know, the original form of Go or, you know, uh, sticks, et cetera, but roughly kind, kind of came about with the, this Kriegspiel um, idea and then with Wargaming in America kind of gaining uh, speed under sec death, Bob Work. Um, and then of course, our little plug there at the bottom for on Wargaming with Matt Cafferty uh, for more on the long history of Wargaming and kind of where it's morphed into currently. Um, with that. So obviously whenever we're talking about games and what games can do, it's also important to recognize what games cannot do. So we can rec we can work through a, a whole bunch of human decisions, et cetera, but also important to note that not all humans create or uh, enact decisions in the same manner. There's um, often inherent biases in human decision-making, um, which means that wargaming needs to remain flexible um, and scenarios and games themselves have to provide some sort of uh, dynamic scenario. So um, that third bullet there about wargaming enabling experiential learning, this kind of, uh, Sebastian will get into that more with our course, but um, really to the point of using war games for education um, and kind of helping them learn and train, not just troops, but as I said, people in uh, the Georgetown SSP program. Um, also want to, for me and uh, my team, we also deal a lot with abstraction. Um, a lot of times it's going to be super difficult, even at the tactical level, to play a game where you're moving individual people around. Um, so oftentimes war, war games are a really good opportunity to create some sort of representative structure, um, to create some sort of, you know, kind of uh, non-realistic scenario to maybe explore uh, real troop movements, et cetera. And that kind of gets to the, to the tenacity um, and the tension between the rigor and the simplicity. And um, I'm sure if people caught the session right before this, um, you kind of saw, hey, like, where's the good form of analysis? I personally do not have the in answer for you on which is better, more rigor or more simplicity, but um, just want to look at, you know, hey, what sort of realism do you want to sacrifice uh, for playability within the scope of your war game? So Sebastian. Thank you, Lexi. Um, so as we go on to discussion about my course at Georgetown, uh, it's a reminder that we are seated sit within the School of Foreign Service um, uh, and further uh, situated within the Center for Security Studies or the Security Studies Program. My course is at SEST 560, which is called Basics of Wargaming. The course is really a, a, a basic introduction to the field of wargaming. It has an, uh, a, a specific scope on tabletop manual games that examine military case studies or things related to defense policy. So the game is really, although the, game, uh, the class addresses broad uh, principles and ideas and tenets the game design, right? In terms of professional series gaming, the, the content is really catered towards creating tabletop manual uh, educational games for um, our DoD community. The co uh, course leverages a diverse set of methods. We use tactical decision games, commercial games, professional uh, design games by other DoD organizations. Uh, these things called design uh, autopsies or exercises, and we do a bunch of other activities to help our uh, students uh, have experiential ways to learn how to do design, which is another way of creating experiential tools. Um, student teams are typically uh, split in between two to three students per group. They will research, design, develop, play test, and execute slash demonstrate an original educational war game uh, by the end of the course. So if you see on the right hand side, you'll see my first cohort back in the fall of 2019 when they're uh, play testing internally um, within our class before we are running it for external guests. So the game on the uh, 
on the table is a game about the Peloponnesian War that the students call Hellenic Struggle. Think it's think of it as a mashup between like Pericles and like Twilight Struggle. It really focuses on hegemo hegemonic power theory and the notion of alliance and uh, alliance costs right during the war between two binary powers. Uh, the course really steadily builds towards a complete game. All the assignments are iterative and cumulative. Right. So you start with a research plan and then you write a scenario paper that is often adapted to be a concept paper, uh, a design presentation uh, over uh, two weeks. And we usually invite external guests because we do those virtually from now on. Um, and we invite commercial designers, professional SMEs about a particular topic because I'm a war gamer, not a, a SME about Roman history per se. Right. And then at the end of the semester demonstration where we run for their final uh, games for external guests from think tanks, um, the air staff, you're in CAA, you're in the crew lack center and many other places. Right. And of course, I, uh, the, the final grade is determined by three major assignments, uh, their final game. Right. All the physical components, how they built their cards, uh, et cetera, a complete rule book. Right. And something called a designer journal. So designer journal is uh, inspired by the old Avalon uh, um, SPI games where they had designer notes and many companies still do these um, that company rule books. Right. That explain why they did certain design choices, the research. And I really wanted my students to be transparent in their choices. Right. Uh, and we can talk more about that later on. Uh, this course is not for the faint of heart. It is incredibly rewarding but also difficult course because you are trying to do something you've never done uh, usually in grad school you you've learned and master certain skills like writing and reading consuming large bits of information and most classes ask you to do those exact same things right uh, my class does none of those things right we do uh, very little writing in terms of actual like term papers right we have no final exam right uh, and much of your reading will be beyond the syllabus right because my syllabus will only teach you how to design games right it won't teach you, or it won't have readings on there that are designed for your particular case study uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So next slide, please. So what are the, some of the case studies that I allow my students to choose? Because they are not random and they are not um, all encompassing, right? So at Georgetown, we have two courses called 500 and 501. 500 is our basic theory class where you learn about liberalism, uh, realism, and all the other IR theories. 501 is our grand strategy class uh, of military studies, where essentially you learn about um, American policy in terms of the military and grass strategy, right? Uh, going back to, you know what I mean, all the major case studies in American history from Afghanistan to Vietnam, War I, War II, the Civil War, and so forth, right? So to complement those and to avoid some of the topics they do, I pretty much avoid anything that is covered in 501, right? Mainly because I feel like usually those topics are covered already pretty extensively throughout your other education, uh, either at the high school level, at the undergraduate level, and through other courses uh, readily available at Georgetown. So my course, right, um, in terms of topics, I try to widen and forcibly choose uh, case studies that are not usually within their realm of typical exposure uh, before the class. Right? So whether it, there are ancient battles like the Battle of Kadesh and uh, um, uh, 1274 BCE, or the, one of my favorite conflicts, the Punic Wars, right? Or the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman uh, Venetian Wars, right? Um, or the Chechens or the Second Battle of the Congo War, right? These are all case studies that I you know, crowdsource from historians and colleagues that were like, what are some very fascinating military case studies that my students can build games on that are usually a little off the beaten path, right? I did not want to have five World War II battle games every semester because I'm pretty sure that's what my students would do if they were given up the choice, right? So to avoid this, my students have to give a three-part preference where they give a three... Uh, choices from the first to the last choice of preference of what case studies they would like to choose. And I invoke two rules. One is that I get final say. Two, um, no group can do the same conflict or same era. So this avoids, um, uh, you know what I mean, having too many 
uh, case studies and games within the same class that are too similar to each other. Um, so, and if you have uh, comments or ideas about certain conflicts that should be included, this is obviously not an extensive list, but a, a sampling of some of the conflicts that I allow my uh, students to choose. But after you choose your case study, you are pretty much autonomy and liberty to define how you're going to examine that conflict, right? For example, are you going to create a logistics-based game about the Russian-Japanese war on a campaign level? Or are you going to focus on a tactical naval engagement at the Battle of Tsushima, right? Or are there other ways to slice and dice some of these conflicts, right? The Chechen war can be a political military case study, right? Or it can be a counterinsurgency in the urban terrain going block for block, right? And in, in sort of in the uh, tradition of Brian Train, right? And there are many ways to do this and I allow my students to sort of cater to what they know and what they are interested in, right? But also at the same time to challenge them to look at case studies that may have never really truly considered uh, in a scholarly way. Uh, next slide. So what are uh, my student design games, right? So essentially throughout the course, they go through a process, which is um, research, uh, developing or designing a conflict schema, the very basis of their logical model, right? Their mental model of how their conflict works, right? Which will eventually be turned into a game system. Um, and then the next thing is creating the narrative. Some of these conflicts can be multi-decades, right? Uh, or generational conflicts. So they have to develop the scenario to understand the history, but also how they're going to scope that history of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, are you going through, uh, are you going to try to develop the entire uh, arc of the Peloponnesian War, or are you focusing on a decisive two, three year period, right? And then they have to decide the game mechanics, the rules, uh, some of the game behaviors, and which we call the game system. And then they have to play test it within their own groups uh, with other students in the program. And I also encourage them to play test with people outside our university and program to give them fresh new perspectives. Um, and they have to balance. Um, the tension between sound and rigorous research and historicity, right? And playability and a fun factor, right? Because these are educational games and depending on your demographic that you're aiming for, which my students are allowed to define for themselves, right? Um, you may have you know I mean, more playability and less of this uh, granular research, right? Or granular detail included in, in your game despite you doing lots of research, right? For instance, if you're creating a game for high school students, right? Which my students are more than allowed to do so, right? Your The level of granularity and complexity may be different than, with, let's say, if you're trying to do something for PhD or grad students, right? Who are, are, are assumed to have steep knowledge about this area, right? Uh, similarly, that also in includes certain design choices, right? If you're creating a game for a military uh, active duty uh, uniform demographic, then you may allow to be do other things that incorporate doctrine, NATO symbols, and certain knowledges and processes reflected in that demographic, right? And again, we, uh, the students will demonstrate their games for defense professionals at the end of the semester. Um, and there are some learning points I wanted to include about the virtual learning environment. This past uh, fall in uh, 2020 was when I first taught this class virtually, and I was absolutely nervous. Uh, I, I thought it could be an absolute train wreck, mainly because Georgetown told us that we were going to the virtual environment two weeks before the semester started. Uh, so we were all told we will be in person or some kind of hybrid, and then last minute they told us we we're all virtual and we had to make this rapid pivot. Um, and Kudos to Georgetown's IT department for allowing us to do that so rapidly and as seamlessly as it was. But it, for as educators and especially as adjuncts, um, it was difficult at times, right? Collaboration, for example, in my class is a key component. It is probably the biggest component, right? You must you have to have regular meetings with your team groups, uh, and there's a certain element of, of creativity and um, co collaboration that you know works in person, working around a whiteboard, right? And collaboration isn't impossible in the virtual learning environment. There are many tools from Zoom's whiteboard feature to Google Documents to Teams to Slack, right? But it just takes more effort. It's easier to avoid a notification from your teammate via Slack or a Discord, right? Than it is to avoid a conversation while you're sitting in that room together at, you know, in a building on campus, right? So it takes more effort. And, and also as an educator, you have to 
make more of an effort to force and you know foster collaboration among your students. And sometimes that requires sending pestering emails or just setting up sessions of saying, hey, your group is meeting this time this week, right? Make sure to meet and I will be there, right? Um, and we just call it office hours, right? Other ways was to find new games and means to expose students to different game design concepts. Usually, depending on the games they choose, right, on the topics they choose, I will bring games from my own collection or borrow collections or borrow games from other people's collections to sort of help them in their design. So if you are looking at, you know, I mean, the, the Gaelic Wars, I'll bring in, you know, Julius Caesar, uh, I'll bring in Falling Sky by Volko Rohinki and other things, right? So we can, you can sort of look at uh, different games that have looked at similar topics or your exact topic, right? Uh, but that's much harder and your choices are much limit, uh, more constrained in the virtual environment, right? Um, and especially, you know, I mean, I know some people in the chat will probably be like, oh, just use Tabletop Simulator, just use Vassal. And yes, I could do those, right? But again, most of my students, when they come into my class, have no experience with games. Um, and they're usually just learning what wargaming is. And there, many of them, the vast majority of them are not hobby gamers, right? So if I was going to use Vassal or Tabletop Simulator, there's also a learning curve. And I also have to consider how much of my class time, right, which is already constrained because I have lots of design to do. Do I want to spend teaching them how to use Vassal or Tabletop Simulator? There's also um, certain examples about technology issues, about uh, Tabletop Simulator and Vassal for some, some students and Vassal is better than others. But one of the things that we use, or I, I used for my class was Battle for Moscow. It's a Java base, you know what I mean, used through overlaps. And that was one way we got around that um, in this past semester, right? Uh, and there are other tools that I've learned to uh, leverage and we can talk about that a little bit later. One of the great things is that we have a variety of tools uh, in the class, right, that I got to learn uh, in terms of Zoom and Slack that allow, you know, I mean, collaboration to be a little bit easier. Um, another problem in the virtual environment, especially in a design course that is group based, is that free writing is exasperated. And we can talk about this a little bit later, but it, is, it was a major issue uh, in the virtual learning environment when groups were trying to create these games that are complex works, right? Next slide. Um, and so for the next couple slides, um, I will less drone on about my boring class and more talk about the exciting work my students do, right? So this is a game called Heroes Rising, uh, Rising uh, designed in 2019 by one of my students named Sora Judge uh, and Hannah and Evan. Uh, she is currently at CNA uh, and continuing her war game career, right? So as you see on the map, it is a game about the ancient civil war between uh, three kingdoms. Um, in China, right? So you play as one of the major factors, right? Like you know, uh, factions or uh, in kingdoms in the, uh, at the time, right? Like Kakao or, uh, or Liu Bei, right? And then you are essentially fighting for military dominance, but also political authentication of China and unification of China, right? Um, it has fascinating elements from various games, right? They borrow the, the node mo uh, node movement system for Frederick by Real Grande games, but they added a little twist by coloring the nodes for certain terrain features, right? There, are, if you see the little abacus in the corner of the second photo is actually how you keep track of uh, movement allotments for specific type of units. Uh, they borrowed the screen from a game, um, from many games. For, for for them, they were inspired by a game called Rising Sun, where you had these hidden uh, uh, movements and actions behind a player's screen, right? Uh, it was fascinating. They did a fantastic job. Um, and I could talk more about some of these games in the chat if you guys are particularly interested. Uh, next slide, please. So these are two other games in that same cohort in 2019. The left-hand side was led by Caitlin Leong, who was a current uh, Goose president. And it's called Reconquering Rome. It's about Belisarius uh, and um, his effort to con uh, conquer Rome again on, uh, for Emperor Justinian for the Byzantine Empire and his uh, and the, essentially the resistance by the Germanic tribes that con uh, that controlled Rome at, at the time. It's a fantastic four-player game that is both competitive and cooperative. So each side, the Romans and the, uh, and, and the Goths are divided by two players. For example, the Romans have uh, Belisarius, who is 
super underrated as a, as a military leader and commander and tactician and Narciss, um, sort of his rival historically. Um, and similarly, there are two historical figures on the uh, on the Gothic side. Um, and then each of those players have team goals that they have to win as a team, right? So I think cooperative games like Pandemic, right? Um, but at the same time, there's only one winner, right? So the way the game works is that you must procure prestige by winning battles, doing certain events, playing certain cards, and whoever among the te winning team has the most prestige wins, right? Uh, so they get the triumph and they're favored by the emperor or by uh, the Gothic nation, right? So there is this fascinating tension um, within the game between player behavior, which I think it makes it really fun. Uh, it was a clever idea by the students to represent some of these historical rivalries that sort of undermine and really change the, the contour of the conflict. The next one is one that I mentioned before about the Peloponnesian War, about Hellenic struggle, which really focuses on a twilight struggle as mechanic by Jason Matthews, where each side is trying to influence nations um, to flip over to their side during the Peloponnesian War. So they have a constraint um, um, strategic assets that essentially uh, represent pressure or bribery or uh, coercion to get people on their side and you are limited by your military deployments by the areas in which are considered allied or aligned with you. Next slide, please. So the next uh, game is called In the Mountain Shadow, also designed in 2019. And it's about the modern day Kashmir um, war. And this was interesting because it looked at a modern conflict and, um, and drew from various elements, right? So there was a part of it. So each there are three, it's a three player game, which in itself is unique um, in many regards for educational games where India, Pakistan, and well, so they created an aggregate player to represent sort of jihadists and terrorists in, in the region. Um, and they are essentially fighting for counterinsurgency uh, control. So think of many of the coin games that Volker Rohingya designed for GMT, right? And draws from many of their traditions. And you'll actually see that they uh, took pieces from uh, games from uh, like GMT's uh, uh, Distant Plane to borrow for some of their game pieces. Um, and it was interesting because each of those players had unique advantages as factions, but also uh, interesting constraints that limited their decision space, right? Um, and this was a great game that I saw uh, then play test over and over again. Um, and as you see on the right-hand side, this is a, from a demonstration that we ran for State Department. Uh, the conflict stabilization office, many of these uh, players you see around the table are FSOs, foreign service officers, who are playing in the Mountain Shadow, as you see in the center board, uh, about the Kashmir. So many of these uh, FSOs were Pakistani, Indian, or, you know, or South Asian uh, experts. And it was fascinating to watch as an instructor um, to see your students' games you know I mean, spurring such an interesting uh, educational experience for professionals, right? Uh, and you can't see quite well in the photo because it's a small, but Caitlin, who's uh, in the black suit uh, at the top of the table, she, she was one of the lead designers for this game and she works at State Department, right? And it was great to see her leverage her own knowledge at State Department and her own interests and combine it with this new skill that she was learning uh, at gaming in my class and apply it back to her workplace. It was, it was really rewarding to see. Uh, next slide. So these are from the last uh, semester in the fall in 2020 during the virtual environment. Um, and I had a smaller class, unsurprisingly, because many of my students chose to defer, uh, hoping that we would be back in class in the, in the spring. Um, so on the left hand side is called a game Russian Roulette. It looks at a modern conflict about or relative modern. Um, the Ukrainian crisis and, uh, and Crimea crisis uh, between the Russians and Ukraine. And this game is interesting because it focused sort of on gray zone activities, which are largely car driven, right? But more than anything, they had a fascinating aspect about attribution, right? So every time the Russians used conventional means, um, they increased their attribution in the region, right? And as you reach certain levels of attribution, they were sort of game triggered events or consequences for the Russian side, right? So the first time you do it, you sort of get sanctioned and it really is a minor nuisance to the Russian player. But the second time, the, the second time you hit sort of a certain level, um, level five in the game, uh, the second time you hit it, it gets more severe, right? Not only 
the sanctions get harder for you, but the, the Ukrainians get more resources to represent aid. And the third time, if you do it, it represents it sort of triggers a, a NATO intervention, and as they send troops, um, and uh, and um, that sort of flood the board of Western Ukraine to essentially allow the Ukrainians to sort of intervene more robustly in Crimea. Um, and this was fascinating because the Russian player has this sort of attribution problem where they have to start thinking about what capabilities do I want to use early and what uh, do, must I be careful of and cognizant of later on as the consequences of attribution become harder, right? Uh, and there's interesting there's, uh, elements of control. So they the way they divided control was not only in physical control, but also uh, informational and I believe economic, if I remember correctly, right? So you can have uh, informational control, like let's say cyberspace control over a particular um, dumb, um, province in Crimea, but the other faction could have physical and economic control of the region, having them having the majority control. So there's this fascinating element of flipping elements of control across the region to sort of you know, undercut the other person's uh, ability to exercise uh, military actions on the board. Um, the, uh, the second game from that cohort was the sino uh, sino vietnamese clash from 1979. Um, and this one was more of a traditional hex-based game, right? And it was fascinating how they did it because they were... The case study itself uh, of the 1979 border war is fascinating because it was over rather quickly, but also both sides declared victory, right? Uh, the Vietnamese essentially won because they didn't lose, and the Chinese supposedly just beat them up uh, and had this punitive campaign against the Vietnamese and essentially uh, avoided a Soviet intervention in Vietnam. So as you see on the right hand side, there's sort of those, those are some of their prototype cards before their final card came out. Uh, and you see the choices where the, the Chinese side has to decide what is their major front. And but they're also they had this interesting mechanic where they had a uh, a four quadrant grid for victory conditions and your job was to move your 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 side's token essentially into a victory strike zone right uh and that's how you won and you had to stay within that uh, strike zone for uh, a particular amount of time and the x one axes were defined by political influence right and also uh the number of cities you controlled right um so as you control more cities right and um uh, and so you can get into these sort of strike zones, but you have to be careful because um, the, there are also triggers for certain activities that could be bad for you if you are too successful, right? For example, historically, the Chinese did not want to conquer Hanoi straight out because they're afraid that this would uh, incur Soviet intervention and allow the Vietnamese to win the war and embarrass the Chinese on an international stage, right? So this was something they had to be worried worry about. So there's always these sort of like, landmines uh, uh, as uh, surrounding your own victory conditions and your strike zone. So that was an interesting mechanic that I, I enjoyed for my students. Next slide. Um, and I promise we're almost done with some of the, the student bragging um, is that this is a war game demonstration that um, Caitlin Leong and Nikolai Rice, some of my, some of my students, um, did for the Krulak Center at the Marine Corps University. And I love this photo because you see a bunch of majors, the lieutenant colonels, and some of the Georgetown students who were not in the class but part of Goose, uh, literally yelling at each other. Um, so this um, the other, uh, one of the majors is pointing at the other because he is, he, I, if I remember correctly, he felt betrayed by some of the actions that and the lack of promises uh, for cooperation. Um, and, it was, and it was really, really fascinating, right? Uh, to see military officers talk about the history of this period, talk about the consequences and on uh, the PME implications, right? But also see engagement between majors who have been in the in the Marine Corps for ten plus years, sometimes, right? And some of my young uh, twenty year old something grad students, right, talking about strategy, operations, tactics, and oh, more importantly, history, right? And having this dialogue, it was great, and it was fantastic to hear on the car ride back. Uh, that the students were really excited to engage with their active duty counterparts, which is something that is very rare for some of the grad students in civilian programs that study um, uh, security studies or defense policy. Next slide. And lastly, uh, we'll start talking about Goose, and I'll hand it over to Lexi because I've been talking way too long. Yeah, so before we jump into goose and all things good about the wargaming society were there any questions for sebastian um either about his class or his experience as a teacher or professor 
I'm hoping to eat up a little bit more time talking until Gary can decide. Rissy. All right, I'm pressing then. So the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, um, I, I was not around for its founding. I joined um, Georgetown actually in fall of 2020. I'll get to that a little bit later about what it's like being a virtual student. Um, but pretty much we wanted to have a space for hobby gamers and professional war gamers, um, as well as those new to war gaming, which oftentimes are students, um, to play games and learn more about not just war games writ large, but different methodologies, right? Um, and so anyone who's been familiar with the Goose webinar series has seen there's a variety of topics there. Um, core principles behind this are accessibility, collaboration, education, professional development, and of course, fun, right? Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, outreach and getting students interested because ultimately at the end of the day, this is a, a student club that we open writ large to the wargaming community. Um, we want it to be fun. So you don't have to be a Georgetown University student. Uh, we want everyone there, um, but the focus is making sure that things remain accessible and uh, collaborative. So a couple of programs um, that we run. Hi, uh, I know Sebastian mentioned that I'm the programming director. Um, we have a lot of virtual Zoom webinars. Those run uh, weekly for you know, changes by semester, depending on uh, Sebastian and some of our community members' class schedules. Um, so right now, I, those are every Tuesday night. We have various game nights, and game nights are a very loose term. Um, oftentimes, members of the professional development community run games for us on the weekend. Um, the HMGS, I think is Historical Miniature Gaming Society Next Gen, um, does a lot of great stuff uh, for us, Jared, over there um, on the weekends. We have wargaming resources. So, you know, Matt Cafferty's book that we mentioned earlier, um, different organizations and where they're located. We have them on that shared Google Drive. Um, so the great thing about being hosted by Georgetown University is we have quite a lot of uh, virtual or collaborative tools that have been provided for us. One of them being a Google Drive that we can either share or give additional accesses to, um, as well as some of that Zoom technology, etc. Um, and just through Sebastian um, and my and other people's connections, Sebastian's a really great faculty advisor and brings in um, Army War College, Naval War College, and the Marine Corps University, um, and then local civilian universities. I would like to just say, you know, we do work with SICE. Um, we have a game coming up root with SICE, um, but we're not limited to that. We work with, especially in this virtual environment, we work with other universities across the country, not just in the DC area. So with that, just a little bit about our transition to a virtual environment. So I know I had mentioned um, I'm still a relatively new student. Uh, I came into Georgetown University in fall 2020, and I believe we had a question on the Discord about like, hey, what's up, like, you know, doing some sort of orientation. Orientation virtually is very limited. Um, speaking from my personal experience, I have not yet even been to the Georgetown campus. So when I look at, hey, what does Goose need to look like and how does it need to shape and morph into this virtual environment? Um, I brought in a lot of the lessons that I had learned in my professional uh, wargaming career and, and life into Goose and how we were gonna kind of go forward. So as Sebastian had mentioned and, and actually shown through some of his class, um, we wanted to do game nights, right? And that becomes, um, you know, infinitely more difficult when you're doing it virtually where uh, if anyone saw behind Sebastian, he has a, I have a Sebastian has a giant game library um, and you can't host games on campus when, you know, there's a pandemic going on, obviously. So uh, luckily we've had a lot of good outreach from the professional community on, hey, this is, you know, how to work Vassal and this is how to get onto Tabletop Simulator via Steam um, or this is even how to build in those or modules in those those servers. So to that extent, we use a variety of those online platforms. Um, it's been really awesome because for me, I came into this being like, hey, I turned the Xbox on um, and it goes. And then somebody said, Lexi, you really like Twilight Struggle. You know, there's a self-adjudicating vassal module for Twilight Struggle. And I was like, cool, that's what we're doing. Um, we're gonna move forward with that. So since March, 2020, when the pandemic happened, we've been doing thing a lot of things virtually. Um, Greatest hits that we've had, uh, just kind of listed a few there. 
a lot of great board game designers, not just uh, in the past semester, but in the past year and onwards actually have um, agreed to collab with us and not just host demos of their game or sessions of their game, but work with students who are interested in wargaming either through Sebastian's class um, or you know just hearing about Goose and what we're doing. Um, and work through kind of the, some of the mechanics that are in the game. And so, um, you know, Pendragon and Nevsky were really good examples of this, where uh, students not just got to play the game, but got to talk with the game designer through um, why they put certain mechanics into the game. Um, so the goal is to provide uh, students and alumni and the larger wargaming community, so everyone here and who's watching this is welcome to join, um, to learn hands-on about war games, different war game types and techniques. So there's a couple of pictures there um, of both Pendragon and then anyone who's familiar with diplomacy. Um, one of our uh, student coordinators found a site called Backstabber, spelled that weird way, um, that will actually host diplomacy. And the great things about both of these were that they were virtual and free, which uh, as a grad student, I always appreciate low cost or free options for my games. So the Goose webinar series, um, so Ashton can talk a little bit more about it and feel free to come up, but um, that's actually how Sebastian wrote me into it. Um, you know, hey, like give a webinar about ag what agile gaming is and um, kind of work from there. Um, the webinar series has covered a lot of different things from coin to what title 10 war games are um, to even like how to do graphic design for war games. Um, so we've got a lot of good webinars coming up, um, continuing throughout the summer. So ju don't just think, hey, semesters ended, um, all webinars and all of these activities cease. We are the Wargaming Society that never sleeps um, colloquially. So uh, feel free to check out our page. Um, we'll go ahead and post that in the chat when we're done with this. And so, our so I will mention something real quick, Lexi, about the webinar series. Um, so uh, the webinar series is a two hour program that we do via Zoom and they're all recorded for YouTube for those in different time zones and um, busy lives that don't want to stick around on a Monday or Tuesday evening at six to eight to watch uh, a webinar lecture, right? Um, and we've talked about, we when we designed the board game webinar series for Goose, we wanted to make sure one, it was uh, inclusive and wide and also innovative in the topics that we approached, right? So we had everything from Ellie Bartel's webinar on the social science of wargaming to Mitch Reed talking about Title X wargaming uh, for the Air Force um, HQ, right? And their staff, right? And then we have commercial designers. I love, personally love the one about uh, Bruce Mansfield's uh, webinar he did on Gandhi, right? And his design, right? Volker Rinke's, um webinar on coin series game design i think it is absolute top class and is the highest rated one on our youtube channel right unsurprisingly uh we also had great ones by roger mason on hybrid warfare pete pellegrino's webinar on the naval war college war gaming during the interwar period is absolutely top class as well and then we have some great speakers coming up this summer that we haven't even announced, right? So like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Arnell of the UK Fight Club will be doing one in the uh, in, during the summer. Stephen Downs Murren uh, will be doing one on uh, malign wargaming, which is a topic that he's been researching uh, and uh, speaking about more frequently in recent years. Um, who else? We also have Major Ian Brown and Jared Cooper from the Krulak Center who will be talking about their efforts at the Marine Corps University in introducing educational gaming. Colonel Tim Barrett of the War Gaming, War gaming Division who designed Assassin's Maze, right? Uh, we'll be talking about his time as their director and his, how he designed Assassin's Maze. And we'll talk a little bit more about Assassin's Maze. I have not forgotten about that question at the end. But these are sort of the wide range of... Um, of speakers that we, we are trying to get. And if you have recommendations for commercial designers or podcasters or anyone related to gaming as a sponsor, client, designer, uh, let us know either in Discord or via email. We are more than happy to reach out to a wide range of people because we think it is these kind of discussions and, um, and forums that are incredibly helpful that will push our field forwards and especially bridge that gap between generations. And hopefully all the knowledge that, uh, um, the vanguard of our community has uh, garnered over years of experience as designers, as consumers, will continue to be passed on to the next generation as they move forward up the ladder.
Lexi, I hand it back to you. So as Sebastian mentioned, a lot of great things coming up. Um, I do have a slide a little bit later with some of my greatest hits. Um, I just don't have the didactic memory that Sebastian has to, to speak to that. Um, but here's a quick example of before we went to COVID of what Goose envisions for game nights or game events. So if this were, you know, like interactive, I'd say, hey, how many people um, who are professional board gamers or hobby gamers have their own game room? Right. So we're trying to create that same type of space at Georgetown, um, you know, have them be sociable, have them be accessible, fun and really get people interested in, hey, here's the different types and breadths of war games. Um, and just want a quick shout out. Um, part of the reason why that's so doable is we've had a lot of great donors who've donated to our gaming library. Um, so really, that gives students the opportunity to, to play a variety of games, whether it's something from the coin series or something from Dan Versing games. Um, I know Thunderpool Apache Leader was one of the first games I played. Um, and then it was just really super insightful for me to learn how different mechanics work. Um, so along the same lines, we also work with different, uh, uh, the Naval War College. We work with uh, George, or George, University, George Washington University. Um, just on some of their crisis games, simulations. And then we also work with obviously SICE and their gaming society to set up, um, you know, kind of cross organizational, uh, either gaming events or methods, et cetera. Um, also, uh, I think it is on my next slide, but Georgetown had um, its first ever competitive wargaming team for uh, the Marine Corps University's wargaming tournament. Um, so obviously, Goose members or member or people who are involved in Goose, we want to give them the opportunity to compete in some of those um, uh, gaming tournaments or events or just straight competitions. Um, in the case of Zenobi and others, so um, Sebastian will speak to a couple points on this slide too. Um, but for me, um, just the transparency and the accessibility. I know. Um, being as, like accessible to not just the instructor but to the resources is probably critical in this virtual environment and with that i'll give it back over to sebastian yeah so some of the lessons learned that we learned during this whole process of setting up goose uh running a student organization during pandemic times um going to the virtual learning environment um and also some learning uh elements for myself as an instructor as an adjunct uh, the first thing is wargaming is often completely foreign territory for students, uh, which invites uh, a crawl, walk, run mentality. This is applicable to my class as much as it is applicable to the student society uh, and Goose's activities, right? And so often people are, want to run these big elaborate games and, and what we have found to be the most productive and, you know, I mean, in demand from our students and our membership there are smaller games right where groups of five or six are able to learn a game more intimately by someone who's instructing them similarly for the class it is a slow process as much as it is condensed it is a slow process of learning each step week by week and practicing those concepts in some manner um, as you work towards your game right as you are crawling towards your uh, your complete game and design and research as well um, and that is something I have to remind myself all the time um, that the students are not um, you know, seasoned war gamers or hobby uh, hobby gamers, and you have to match your pace and your teaching to them, right? Similarly with the types of games you introduce that we use at Goose, right? Uh, people often, and I love complex games as much as anyone else, right? But at the same time, with to introduce people who have never played games before, you play Axis and Allies, you play Pandemic, you play Catan, you play, you know, games are accessible to them, Scythe, right? And then you work up uh, them through the cycle of games, right? So you can go to more complex games like the Coin series or uh, Blue Water Navy and other games, right? And the idea is to uh, get them to crawl, then walk, then run, and hopefully they will run off to be war gamers in, their, in our field, but that's the hope. Uh, the second thing is transparency and accessibility were critical elements, not only to the classroom, but also as our organization pr uh, proceeded forward. We, I was always 
aiming to under have the students understand why we're doing this and why this is due at the same time right and the idea is to make myself as accessible to the students whether it be in office hours whether it be in slack to answer their questions or to give them suggestions about research they should read books that they should re reference to or even connect them to other subject matter experts that i i can't help them with right um for instance if you were looking at i mean the crimean war um for a uh, russian roulette we we i tried very hard and you know what i mean uh set up uh research interviews right uh for them and the group with state department officials who look at that region with other dod experts right and even other uh, professors on our faculty right and that is uh and you know what i mean that i found that if you as an instructor go the extra mile your your students will also reciprocate that in the work that they do um this is one of the first lessons that I learned after the first course is when I was designing the syllabus, I had as few readings as possible. I, I boiled it down to what is the essential readings. Um, and I left a lot in optional readings. But uh, as I was going through the faculty syllabus uh, class review, they told me I didn't have enough readings. They were like, 100 readings is not enough for grad school of, of our caliber. You need to be like in the 200, 300 pages a week. Uh, and I was like, that will crush my students, right? Because um, I had to explain to them, they were going to do readings on their own case studies, they had to do research for their games, right? And there's a lot of group work beyond readings, right? It's not structured the way a normal grass, uh, class is structured. Uh, nonetheless, I was forced to add more readings uh, that first time I taught this class. And it ended terribly, right? To the point that a couple of weeks in the class, I had to manually tell them, like, cross these readings off your syllabus. We are not going to do them, right? Do not worry. You're and because our plates get very, very full with play testing, project uh, coordination meetings, and uh, other problems of like you know, proofing cards and all these things during the course that consume massive hours of time, right? And that means you have to give up on some of the readings to give the students those times because they have other engagements like family, uh, um, jo full-time jobs or other courses, right? Uh, one of the things for later iterations um, I had to do was to add other forms of information like YouTube videos, podcasts that I found to be interesting to replace readings uh, to help them to manage that information overload. Uh, another issue that I mentioned before is the free writing problem with any group dynamic you as an instructor have to worry about student agency um, and also at the same time balancing student responsibility so uh, currently the students are uh, have the option to form their own groups i have to approve them and then if there are issues i ask the team leads which i designate in the beginning to come to me privately and we will deal with it uh, on the slide but that that may and may not work sometimes right because of the personality what if your your free uh, the free writer is your friend and you want you don't want to wrap them out to your instructor there's also issues with that uh, or do you set up some kind of secret policing-esque informing structure where you grade your other teammates and that essentially is a way for you to uh, anonymously but also inform on bad free writers in your group uh, i have yet to do it i uh, has never gone to the point that is a problem right uh there was a question in the chat about people about the worry about people dropping your course uh that has never happened to any of the courses i've taught either at georgetown at command and staff or um at the U.S. Naval Academy, mainly because uh, they don't allow you to after the first second week in my class. If you do, it, uh, you just lose the money. So um, that means a group is handicapped. But not only that, you usually probably lose 10K for dropping out of my class, right? Uh, if not more, uh, depending on the institution. Um, so that has never been a problem. Um, usually um, to avoid that is also the before the, the drop period, the, the lectures are pretty easy and it's pretty easy going. And then it ramps up towards the middle of the class. Um, and then by the time they're in that, that point, they're in too deep to drop the class anyway. Um, the second thing is virtual games uh, require a different suite of preparation and troubleshoot, uh, uh, troubleshooting abilities. Uh, and technology can be a double-edged sword, right? As you see with some of our Zoom and Discord problems about people connecting, finding the right link. Uh, but there are a, a vast array of tools, right? From Roll20 to Vassal to Tabletopia to Tabletop Simulator, right? And it's really catering them to understand, right? For certain groups, for certain classes, I have lots of my students who are on Steam who play other games like 
Dota and League of Legends. So they're familiar with Steam. So I will then uh, use Steam games to help them play games in class, right? For us as in office hours, right? So I will give them Steam accounts that we cater as Goose that we fill with games like um, Hearts of Iron or uh, Access and Allies or Root or Lock and Load, right? Any of these games that we have curated and then we lend out these Steam accounts for them to use during the course of the, of the se semester and term, right? Um, also, focus on experiential learning. So PowerPoint is dull, and I find the irony of it as we are doing PowerPoint uh, for this presentation. But um, I found that the lectures that my students focus and remember the most from their uh, from their class were the ones where we did exercises for half of it, right? Where I did less talking um, and more uh, uh, having the students do something. For instance, we do these uh, great sort of thought exercises where we look at a game that we played in the class, let's say Axis and Allies, and we do something called design autopsy like a week or two later where we design uh, where we essentially dissect the design why is it why is it this way um what are some gameplay dynamics built uh, as a consequence of this of these design choices uh, what are some historical elements that are abstracted or simplified or excluded right how can we make these games uh different or add a different dimension right for example for access to analyze what if every time you conquered a uh, uh, a province or a zone, right? You have to leave someone behind, right? Would that change the game the dynamic? And why would you want to do that as a designer? And why didn't they do it, right? Um, how do you do C lanes? Uh, we, there's always lots of debate about the weird ways the C zones are designed in, in Axis and Allies, but they're not weird. They are weird, but they are purposeful. They're designed a specific way to increase a certain type of uh, gameplay between uh, gameplay by the players, right? Um, we found those to be interesting. The students uh, hate tactical decision games the first time they do it because most of them are civilian at Georgetown. Uh, but they learn to love them or at least appreciate them for what they do. Uh, and it's a great way to, for them to understand the power of game-based learning, right? Uh, students also have uh, a wide range of careers and paths they want to do after Georgetown, after our graduate program. And it's important to note that uh, not all of them will become board game designers or even go into our security defense realm, right? Some of them go on to work for NGOs or be analysts for the FBI. And it's important to cater to understand that not all of them will be designers. And sometimes it's about making them better sponsors and better analysts in the future with board gaming as something they are aware of and have increased literacy in. Uh, next slide. Um, so... Um, I will briefly talk about what is on the horizon um, for uh, for Goose. One of the things is that, like in two weeks, uh, we are running a Vassal module game for Assassin's Maze, which is an educational war game designed by McWill's Wargaming Division, led by Colonel Tim Barrett, who will be retiring sadly and is a total loss uh, for the Marine Corps and the DoD community uh, writ large. But he built this game you see on the right hand side, which is about a hypothetical war between the U.S. modern forces and China uh, in the Indo-Pacific theater. It is largely um, a naval air focused game. There are ground elements to it because um, that are roughly at the brigade level, but those hexes are 200 nautical miles, right? So it's quite large. Um, so the ground component tends to have very incremental and low key effects in the game. Mostly it's a missile slinging air battle uh, game uh, across the theater and it has a wide range of uh, applications and they are working on expansions of this uh, game and it's I can talk more if you have specific questions about uh, the game design but it currently is being used for PME education here at um, at Command General Staff College I know it's been used at the US Naval Academy with my own midshipman class um, we are using it at Georgetown in a couple of weeks uh, via Vassal, right? Um, but it is sort of controlled in uh, who we send it out to. Um, we are also doing naval miniature sessions. One of our great professors on the adjunct faculty who teaches a class on military operations, John Gordon at RAND, will, uh, has run general quarter sessions for us. Um, we're hoping to do those again in the future in the fall. We're working with other wargaming organizations like Command and General Staff College with James Theron and Mike Dunn, uh, Army War College uh, to establish uh, wargaming fellowships. And we, we're hoping, fingers crossed, we'll have an announcement uh, in the coming weeks with one of our partners. Uh, but more than anything, we also do lots of game collaborations with them, right? Um, 
Lieutenant Colonel uh, Derek uh, Martin, who is one of the deputies at the Army War College's uh, Wargaming Department, is running uh, a Matrix game via Blackboard for our students um, this Saturday, actually, at 10 uh, Eastern Time until 1530. And is a great way for our institutions to collaborate and coordinate and, you know, I mean, uh, run games for each other. As a thank you, last year we sent uh, a copy of our Hellenic str uh, Struggle game designed by our students for their use uh, at the War College. We also have amazing uh, webinar speakers coming up, including Jason Matthews, um, the author and designer of Twilight Struggle, uh, Kylene Hunter at the Air Force Academy, who will be talking about her Wakanda game and how she uses gaming at the Air Force Academy. Captain Joe Brick of the Australian Defense College, who will be talking about their efforts at ADC um, and how they're trying to incorporate wargaming in Australia. Um, and they talked a little bit about it in Connections Oz. But if this would be a great time to field any questions from the group. So during the orientation period, how do you attract students who have no wargaming experience? So great question. Um, and I think this is from Hero. Um, so one of the things I do as a faculty advisor uh, and one of the things that Goose does is to actually um, grab people that we think are have interest or in, uh, or potential in war game design and try to, you mean, know, shepherd them into the class. But also at the same time, people that come from the class and finish the class we try to shepherd them back into leadership positions at Goose. So it's a bit of a self-feeding tail at our program. Um, so one of the things we do is one, uh, I make an effort to go to all the admitted uh, students, uh, faculty panels. I did one last week where I will talk to admitted students into our program and talk about my course, about wargaming, about uh, what they will be doing in the class and try to attract them into the, into the class. Other times we do um, where I do podcasts that are campus related, like during the SSP podcast to encourage people to be intrigued by wargaming by the class and hopefully take the class, right? A little bit of it's about word of mouth, right? Is that if your students like your class, they'll tell other students to take it, right? And they'll be your greatest ambassadors uh, for people to take your course. Uh, another part of it is to hold really great games through Goose um, and get people interested in gaming and then eventually they will go into the course, right? So many of our Goose members have already emailed me and they'll ask me, hey, are you teaching your course in the spring, which I do not. I only teach in the fall. Um, and they'll ask me, hey, are, can you make sure I get in this class or, or, or what can I make this class if I'm missing this week and we'll sort it out. So it's really about getting the students to talk about your course, uh, getting exposure to new students into your program, um, and making sure it's exciting and something interesting and, uh, and be straightforward that is challenging, right? And then you'll get the right demographic of people that want both the excitement and are willing to overcome the challenges of war game design. Next question, please. Are any of the games made the, by the class available for sale anywhere? This is a fascinating uh, question and it is both a short and long story. So for those who are familiar with commercial game publication, um, publishers do not like when you like uh, talk publicly before they make commitment to publish your game. So I will say this, there are publishers interested in several of the students games over the, over the, the years that I've been running this course, both at Georgetown at Command and Staff at the Naval Academy. They have asked us to keep it hush hush um, and they're still going through the re review process and you know, COVID and pandemic times have made that more difficult. Um, but there, so the short answer is no, but hopefully in the future, yes. Um, and for some of our games, we're hoping to make a vassal and tabletop simulator modules for other educators to use um, because we really want these games to be used by other classrooms and other educators and other PME institutions um, to help them, right? Because if you, let's say you were teaching a class about, I don't know, Napoleonic Wars or hybrid warfare, maybe the, our students have designed a game that can fit your needs, right? So that's partly the hope. Or any game design competition with other student wargaming communities. Uh, this is something that's been on our radar for a while and we haven't done it yet, uh, mainly because COVID has 
put a lot on our plate already to run the programs that we do. We do want to do game design competitions or at least collaborations. This is something that we are trying to do with a colleague of mine um, who teaches in the Netherlands. And we have not announced it yet, but we're trying to do something where our students can uh, collaboratively uh, design games uh, on specific topics, or we can serve as game sponsors for certain topics, right, and help um, create a collaboration that way. So the answer is not yet, but hopefully in the future, uh, we will have in the coming months have an announcement on this regard. Has anyone built a war game in your class that addresses anti submarine warfare? Who asked this question because you are a man or a woman after my own soul? Uh, I've been trying to get my students to design games on particular case studies, including anti submarine warfare, um, for a while. And every time I try to convince them, they choose something equally uh, interesting, but not the one I want them to do. Um, this is actually one of the topics that we are, as Goose are sponsoring in this um, yet to be mentioned uh, collaboration in terms of design. But no, none of my students have created an anti-submarine game at, at any of my institutions yet, even my midshipmen, uh, which is very really sad. But one day in the future, hopefully they will. And if you're interested, just follow up with me on Discord and we will coordinate via email. Is the class part of a broader subject or do you teach a wargaming design course specifically? So my class is a wargame design class, right? It is sit, uh, situated within the military operations concentration within uh, the security studies uh, MA, right? So you are a grad student in the SSP program, either you are taking my class as an elective in, uh, as part of your course of study, or it is fulfilling the military operations uh, requirement in the program for that concentration, right? So it is part of a wider concentration, but the class itself is focused specifically on design, right? So the purpose is to produce design skills and produce an educational game at the end. Hopefully that answers your question. What's the best way to send potential students to Goose? Uh, so it depends. Um, Goose itself is public and requires no requirement and has no limitations on membership except for good behavior and a good attitude. Um, there's no experience, uh, experience requirement and it's not limited to Georgetown students, right? So we at our membership are roughly about 40, 60. <laughs> so 40% of our membership of roughly 800 is Georgetown students. Um, and it has been difficult at times to get um, participation on on campus because of COVID, obviously, because we haven't been on the yard and many of our grad programs or and extracurricular societies have been uh, temporarily put on hold because of lack of funding um, during uh, virtual learning environment. But if you have a student, let's say, I don't know, pick a university, Yale, right? Uh, or American or SAIS, right? And you want to send students to Goose, just send them to our website, www. Uh, guwargaming.org and you can sign up for our newsletter and you're essentially a member of Goose, right? You can attend all of our events. Um, you can reach out to us via our email, which I will toss into the Discord chat, but it is open to anyone. So we have uh, a wide range of people. So at our webinars, we have some of the the titans of our field, like Matt Caffrey and Peter Perla is a regular at our webinars. Um, at the same time, you have students who are just learning about wargaming and attending these webinars, and that produces a great sort of generational uh, uh, mixing and blending of perspectives. Um, next question, if there are any left. Is there a link to download Assassin's Mace? No. So um, it is physically produced by the Marine Corps Association through collaboration through the um, Marine Corps Wargaming Division and Colonel Barrett. So if you know Colonel Barrett and you are either active duty units or a PME institution, you can reach out to Colonel Barrett through the global inventory and email him asking for a physical copy. Um, I know they've been running out as they've been having tremendous demand for it. Uh, to, for a, dink, a link to download Assassin's Mace, they have asked those who, like us, who use it not to share it uh, without permission. Uh, so uh, if you are another uh, Wargaming University uh, program or a PME institution or a military unit, uh, you can email me and I will send your request to Colonel Barrett uh, and the Wargaming Division. And if they're okay with us sharing it with you, we will happily do so and send you the Vassal module. 
what are the best war games to play to introduce newcomers with no war gaming experience? Uh, so this actually, I will half punt it to Lexi and ask her for her opinion as our program director, and I'll toss in my opinions as well. But Lexi, you want to answer uh, it first? Yeah, so one of my go-tos for um, no wargaming experience, but it, experience or an interest in history has always been Twilight Struggle, not just because um, it's a really cool interface on Vassal, it's rule enforcing, you don't kind of have to like read the rule book and keep opening it in a different tab, um, but it also really gets to the heart of like what a competition game is, right? So a lot of times you go into different conflict games and you, um, you know, you have different mechanics that work within that, but it, the, the competition mechanics and the influence points um, in Twilight Struggle are often um, uh, sought after, et cetera. Another uh, good one that is kind of less historical, but also has some good world building mechanics um, and is easily accessible is Scythe. Uh, Goose runs many Scythe sessions uh, via Steam and via Tabletop Simulator, and of course has copies of the game itself. Um, so those are kind of the two that I go to. Um, my war game experience is very limited, so a lot of my game designers will give me um, card-based games, et cetera. I think right now the one I have as a joke is the uh, Top, Gun, Top Gun party card game um, with like indiscernible rules. So if anyone knows how to play that, please let me know. So uh, before we get to the agile board gaming question, which I will also punt to Lexi because that is her specialty um, during her day job is, in terms of what is the best introduction war game, I think it depends on your on your demographic on who you are trying to get excited about gaming, right? And what they're trying to learn in the context of the class or setting that you're trying to do, right? So for instance, um, I use Axis and Allies a lot, mainly because it is something that is semi-familiar with, uh, with many of my students, even if they're not hardcore gamers, they at least understand of it. The, there's a very low intimidation level to it uh, but it does take a while right even though it's a simple game it can take a long time right um but we i've used it by giving the um, the steam version of the game via our um, steam accounts to our students and we allow them to play against the ai ai and that usually helps our, our uh, the class duration times and allows intermittent play um also we use battle for moscow which is a simple game uh, and the Ober Labs uh, Java-based website version of it. And we found that to be incredibly useful introducing war game concepts, especially the, uh, some basic concepts like you know, terrain and hexes and unit combat strength and taking hit, uh, hit losses and combat result tables. Those are all simple uh, war gaming uh, concepts that are inside Battle for Moscow. Uh, also depends on some of your demographics. So with one of my groups, um, I overheard one of them talking about Game of Thrones at one semester, uh, and they were all sort of really eager into it as I was walking into class uh, one one week. And I play, I ran for their first war game, Game of Thrones Risk, and I added some house rules to make it a little bit more robust and a little more balanced. But it was like throwing catnip into like a herd of cats, and it was they would not stop playing it. Right? I originally slated the office hours to be three hours on a Saturday. We ordered some pizza, and we had some times, and we they came and played Game of Thrones, and I thought they would leave. Obviously, it's a Saturday, right? But they uh, stayed until 7.30, and they would not let me leave until they finished the game. Uh, and then uh, next class, they, told, they kept asking me and emailing me next, the next time they would play it. Uh, eventually we couldn't because we had other things to do in the class, uh, but they just went out and bought it themselves and they started playing with their significant others and with each other in the class. And so it really depends, right? It's about really finding that sweet point that your, your, uh, your crowd or your class is really sort of interested in and finding that, that pressure point and applying it. Like for with some of my uniform services who have different, um, pace and, uh, and preferences, uh, I use Frederick uh, by Rio Grande Games, and that's one of my preferred games to use with them. I also use Assassin's Mace with them a lot, mainly because it uses the terminology and concepts and knowledge they already know uh, in their day job. Um, so that also increases uh, uh, element to it. Um, I also use my Fleet Marine Force game sometimes with my Marine Corps crowd. Um, 
And with uh, miniature uh, for naval miniatures, it tends to be the best type of games for my midshipmen. It is intuitive. It is easy. Uh, I've used general quarters with them several times, and it's a very easy game to get them hooked on um, because you don't really have to think about too many things. You worry about one or two ships on a naval miniatures. There are a couple of rules, and then you start hearing you know, firing at your uh, other um, peers and colleagues, right? And it's really fun. And they usually do that for about four hours on a Saturday. And I found those to be really um, helpful situations. But if you have other suggestions or comments about other games that we should be using as introduction games, uh, toss them in the Discord and I'll make sure to give them a fair shake, uh, of course. Um, and then I hand it over to Lexi to talk about Agile War Game. Yeah, to Sebastian's point, we're always looking for great new games to play, um, especially if you have copies that you're willing to donate or if there is Vassal or online modules um, that we can pass out or help students download and get and play it in with. Um, so Agile Wargaming, I'm going to obviously direct, because I could go on and on about this for multiple hours, um, I'm going to direct you to my Goose talk that I gave with my uh, counterpart, Phil Bolger, um, and that is under our Goose events. I'm sure Sebastian or I will make all of the links available to everyone who's interested for past events. Um, if not, if you're already on YouTube, you can look up the Georgetown University Wargaming Society and all YouTube of, or all recorded events are hosted there on our YouTube site. Um, but I think where the confusion is, is there's this, you know, Lean Six Sigma um, agile methodology, and that is not the same as agile wargame or wargaming or agile gaming. Um, agile gaming is pretty much just kind of what my team does. It's shorter turn games, um, you know, anywhere on that spectrum from a discussion or seminar based type event all the way up through, um, you know, multiple day events. We typically don't like to do anything over that four to six hour range. That's kind of our sweet spot. And so when you say something um, is agile, it's just kind of uh, compressing all of our timelines. Um, you know, instead of taking six months to develop a game, we oftentimes have only six weeks. Um, so just making sure that we're remaining agile, nifty, and that is why we are called the Foxes as well. Um, so. At that, I think there was one more question. And I'm going to pass this one to Sebastian because I have not played Assassin's Mace yet. Yeah, but she will on Vassal in a few weeks as we are running it for Goose. Um, are there any features in Assassin's Mace addressing U.S. political constraints or direct actions with regard to them by Chinese strategy, or is it pure military versus military sim? Um, so if you want to learn a lot more about Assassin's Maze, because there is, is a great educational game, it's really flexible. Uh, there is a, a learning curve to it. Uh, for hobby gamers, it won't be too intimidating. But for regular PME military officers who have not war game before, um, especially if this is their first time and they're majors, like it can be it can be a considerable um, investment in time in teaching them how to play the game uh, and not hate it. Um, but if they're if you're able to teach it gradually um, and have them play throughout a couple of iterations, they will really enjoy it and find it uh, insightful for the courses and uh, tasks they are being tasked with uh, in terms of the national security strategy. But uh, in terms of the question, the game itself has no fixed scenario, so it just comes with the uh, mechanics in terms of how to adjudicate combat moves, right? So in, in that way, it's a military versus military sort of simulation. But at the same time, you can create. Uh, different political constraints and uh, create sort of these sort of uh, left and right lateral limits, but also sort of curated, uh, curated and narrow situations. Like you can do um, uh, um, freedom of navigation operation where it's less shooting, but more about maneuvering and sort of that competition space. Or you can have one that you're, just, I don't know, you know what I mean? the US is and China are just going straight out to World War three level of fighting, right? Or you can do a submarine game, right? That where one side has submarines and one side is trying to protect convoys or whatever uh, in a particular region of the world, right? Uh, think Atlantic Chase, right? Or Watu, right? Um, or you can have uh, certain political constraints be associated with certain types of actions or the restrictions on weapons or releases and all these things. So I've run several games of Assassin's Mace with various uh, political constraints and uh, scenarios uh, that go from the very low end of competition to the very high end of, uh, of releasing whatever 
you know, I mean, forces you have, right? So sometimes in conventional fight scenarios, I will have students will receive reinforcement schedules, right? Uh, but that only kicks in as soon as conflict starts. And before that, you're operating under different political and uh, rules of engagement constraints. Uh, and it really depends on what kind of crowd you're doing. Like, um, I try to keep it pretty simple for my midshipmen because they are not, uh, they haven't gone to any of the military war fighting schools yet. They're still, yeah, you know I mean, as uh, Kylie Hunter put it yesterday, just 20 year olds in fancy pajamas. Um, and it's, uh, you're trying to get them exposed to the notions of how carrier strike groups and destroyers and how joint warfare uh, and coordination works. Uh, and with some of my majors who have been around the block into command and with the fleet, you can add more complexity to it. You can have them fill out weaponeering matrices. You can have them fill out uh, street, uh, commander's intent and all these other processes that are representative and reflective of their own processes as staff officers um, at different levels, at the component, at the task force, at the battalion or whatever level that you want them to be. Right? Any other questions? How about matrix games? Do you teach and have students have a chance to make and run their own game? So I'm so I'm assuming you mean matrix games as in like the uh, the game structure and not like matrix games the, the company, right? So if you're referring to that, right? So no, my students are designing tabletop uh, manual games, right? So they do not create matrix games, right? If I was had time and I could clone myself, I would do a whole slew of these classes, right? So that my class is sort of an intro and then you do other uh, techniques that include matrix games, right? And doing one on analytical gaming as well. But so I don't do matrix games because I wanted them to produce in the box commercial style educational games that we could ship out um, uh, to the fleet, to the operating forces, to other universities and, um, and, that's why I want it, right? And also because of the concentration that I sit in within the program, which is the military operation study, uh, matrix games were excluded during the syllabus writing. But uh, I personally have no problem with matrix games, right? Um, but the students do not uh, design matrix games, but they can have political elements to it that allow blended adjudication that introduce elements of matrix games. They are, they are taught what matrix games are in different formats, but they do not design them for their own games. Um, they are allowed to participate in major style games all the time through groups. Uh, the game that Army War College is running for us this Saturday via Blackboard is a matrix game on the South China Sea, actually, uh, that they design and use for their students at the War College. Um, so there are other opportunities beyond the class in, to participate uh, in matrix games. Other questions? So uh, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. Um, and what else? Are there any other questions as we wait for a few seconds as people drop in last minute thoughts? But one of the things that we want to mention is if you want to get involved with Goose or are curious about what we're doing, uh, about how we're collaborating with other institutions, whether you are a PhD student, uh, instructor, uh, uh, officer at a unit uh, in the fleet or in the operating forces, uh, or just someone really curious about gaming, or if you're a longtime hobby gamer and you want to run a game for us or in collaboration with us, um, just email me at uh, sjb261 at georgetown.edu. I promise I will get back to you um, within a day or two of your email. You can uh, find our website at www.guwargaming.org. It has our schedule, it has our uh, our email uh, for the society, um, it has um uh web links to our partners and to some of our uh, tools that we use and of course you, you will find our youtube a channel on um that has all of our webinars that we've been doing for the last year and i think we're over i think 60 now on um, the past year because we do once a week now at this point so uh any other further questions uh before we end our session here a little bit early All right, it seems like we are done for the day. I uh, hope you found our presentation to be um, insightful and hope you uh, produce some interest in, uh, in what we're doing at Georgetown. Um, and please reach out to either Lexi or myself, and we are happy to set up um, time to talk or coordinate via email, uh, because I think it's really important for, our, uh, for us to 
cultivate interest, but also ta uh, talent at the younger level, right? To get new blood and new perspectives into our into our field. And I think that will really uh, push the ball forward for our community. And I think that's it, Greg, unless 